Um, this, is a, this is really a wonderful opportunity, and I, I want to thank the organizers and, the, and, and you folks for attending. Um, I we can consider this really much a, a companion talk or a follow-on talk to the talk we just heard from Victoria. It's, uh, I'm going to be focusing on data. Uh, 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 we're both very interested in sharing and in the sort of the nature of science and the, how it gets done currently. Um, my background is also in statistics. Um, and so I guess I, I was a, a data guy. Um, my job was to uh, design experiments, help scientists uh, organize their thoughts about that, uh, actually be involved in information systems that were used to collect data. I analyze data and provide it to others. So today we're going to be talking about improving research data sharing, um, especially in the context of repositories. Um, and in my current work as, as the Vivo project director, I've, I've come more and more in contact with the library community, uh, the way they think and, the, and their role uh, in, um, uh, in helping uh, uh, with the problems of uh, data sharing and reuse. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna, uh, to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, where data comes from, uh, what are the data processes of science, what do we mean by sharing, or at least what I mean, and I hope to generate some conversation. So, uh, what is this data sharing that we're talking about? Um, is the sharing important? Um, why don't scientists share their data? Uh, and in that, uh, I'll have a, um, a series of ideas that have all come from my personal experience working with scientists and, and being one myself. So what 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 were we thinking when someone said data sharing and we said no, what, what were we thinking? Um, uh, the context of data, uh, that is what, what would it take to produce data that could be reused? Uh, and then what could be done to improve the sharing of data? And for that, it's pretty much an open conversation and I, we should leave some um, sufficient time to, uh, uh, to have a, a, a conversation about what could be done uh, to improve the sharing of data. So let's uh, start with, so where do scientific data come from? Um, well, most of my career was spent um, outside this room. So uh, for me, this is, a, this is a data production facility, right? You might have thought of it as a, you know, a surgical suite, and you might have been the person on the table there, not potentially thinking about data. But this is where data comes from, okay? uh, and so the, there's some kind of climate in which uh, data is the byproduct of what's going on in this room, uh, and whether that's imaging or uh, a designed experiment or medications or surgical procedure or details about the procedure, or the people who are involved, or all of those things, uh, it's data production. Um, as a very junior biostatistician, I was involved in uh, kidney uh, transplant registry, and I was analyzing the success of grafts, uh, kidney grafts, and, uh, and, and the success of the patient, whether they lived. Um, and I had done my sophisticated analysis as a junior scientist, and I showed it to the principal investigator and he looked at what I had in my model and he said, Mike, if you want to know whether the patient's going to live or die, you have to know who did the work. There are good surgeons and not so good surgeons. So there's, uh, there's a lot of context uh, about the procedure and the work and the science that we have to be aware of uh, that might have to go with um, the data, uh, that we, what we might have thought was the data, in, in order to be successful. So there's, a, there's a, an example of uh, a context uh, for the production of data. Um, here's another one. Uh, so this is the Large Hadron Collider. It produces data. It produces a lot of data. It produces a lot of data very quickly. Um, and a very, very different kind of data. Um, now these guys are pretty good at cyber infrastructure and they're capturing a lot of data. Um, uh, so, I, you know, some, sometime when, I, when I think, when I see a machine like that, I'm, I'm thinking about the data that's coming off of it, its volume, characteristics, the context of that data. Um, here's another kind of data that, uh, that we had some experience with over the course of my career. Um, 
Uh, the agricultural people, you know, for people who are in statistics, you know, we owe a lot to the agricultural people uh, in terms of designed experiments, uh, hypothesis testing, uh, and the concept of data. I always liked working with agriculturalists. They knew that they had to plan their experiment in order to get a good result, and that their that that planning was well worth it because it was going to take some time to grow the experimental results. <laughs> so they were very interested in planning, and the best among them were the far forestry people. It was going to take a long time to get that data. Uh, and so they were, they were good at thinking ahead. Um, but their context and the way they thought about data, um, different. Uh, uh, and now, of course, they also have their own uh, molecular uh, uh, consequences, and they are uh, now heading over into environmental science. Uh, and over there, uh, we have a context that is, again, quite different. Um, with sensor nets and imagery, uh, for orbital imagery and other uh, kinds of world scale data coming at us from uh, a lot of different directions. Um, so uh, a different context for data and a final collection for data um, is us. So we're all uh, producing data um, apparently every moment of every day now. Um, and so the, the social networks, the, the Google flu uh, tracker that we heard of, uh, examples of data coming from each of us uh, through our personal devices and generating some kind of analyses. Um, but all of those uh, scientific uh, uh, data, pro data things, uh, those processes, those, those, those domains um, have some underlying um, scientific uh, data processes uh, and some underlying scientific concepts. Um, uh, and so what, 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 what might they be? And, and so here's, a, um, here's a, a figure that helps me kind of think about what data production and reuse um, looks like, or at least what I hope it kind of looks like. So down at the bottom, you have scientists creating data. And they're creating data in all the ways we just heard about. And they're creating data sort of for their own purposes in some kind of isolation, um, maybe in a team science setup, maybe in a large scale team science data setup like the Hadron Collider, um, but at various scales of, of isolation or, or uh, team science. Uh, and they're doing that with some kind of um, limited or local kind of machine readable semantics. They may not have any of that. They may not know what that is. Um, some kind of irregular preservation um, sufficient for getting the next grant. Um, and, and, and in general, a highly variable means of production, highly variable. Okay, so they're, they're producing data in a wide variety of different ways, very wide variety of different ways. And now we're asking them to share their data. And apparently that is a thing, you know. There's, you know, there's the White House, and there's, you know, there's papers and conferences, and it's a thing. You know, we're supposed to share our data. And that seems like kind of a simple idea, uh, but as we just heard, you know, in, in terms of code, and uh, you know, the, and the concepts are very similar for data. There's, there's issues of disclosure and discovery, and, and data use agreements, and um, and maybe some kind of curation requirements on the way to the repository, um, and maybe some kind of formatting requirements on the way to the repository. Uh, so if you're going to share, who you're sharing with, you're sharing with maybe a an, maybe a library, maybe a research institute, maybe corporations, maybe uh, uh, agencies. Uh, federal or you know, state or local agencies of some kind, uh, you're, you're putting the data somewhere that isn't your place. Uh, and on the way to that place, things are going to happen. Okay? And so we want to think about that, those processes. What are those things that happen? So I have the data. I'm using it. I mean, it's in my flow. I'm, I'm working with it every day. And now we're going to share it, and something is going to happen. What is that something that's going to happen on the way out of the scientific context and into uh, some kind of preservation mechanism that isn't mine okay, as a scientist? Okay? That's data sharing. Okay? So what, what is all that stuff? Okay? And on here, it's the, the, all those purple arrows. Okay? Something is happening between the scientist and the archive. Okay. Now, at the archive, those agencies and libraries, institutes, corporations, they have their own worldview, they have their own uh, incentives, they have their own uh, you know, way of doing things. 
And, and they may have some ideas about you know, semantics or the way data should be structured or some kind of whatever, but, they, but in general, they tend to have very good, uh, good uh, strong concepts of preservation. That's what they're there for. They're archivists. They, they believe in preservation. So whatever you give them, it should stick around. Right? Um, and the question is what to give them. Right? And if we gave it to them, how would we get it back out the other end if we wanted to reuse it? So, so they, but, but, these, but, the, but the archives in the middle there, they, they are, have very variable access policies and very different ways of doing things, uh, very different procedures. Uh, and if you're a scientist, um, you're dealing with, well, maybe dozens, depending on the nature of your research, it could be hundreds of different archivists, each with their own formatting, preservation instincts, policy, uh, and, and how you would share with one is not the same as how you would share with another. Um, and now if you're in the NIH realm, maybe there's a mandatory sharing requirement with some specific repository that was named in the, in the RFA. Uh, and so you're gonna have to master that uh, in order to be able to do the work or to be able to accept the grant. Um, and if you did that, so if you produced data and you shared it and the archive had it, then you would wanna reuse it. You would want to reuse not only your own data, which was put in the archive, you'd want to be able to use all your colleagues' data. You, so you, want, you want to be able to go get it. You want to, you want to get it and you want to be able to combine it and then you want to be able to produce some kind of new science with it. And that may be, you know, you may be a domain scientist or a data scientist or even a citizen scientist looking to get data uh, and put it together for some kind of reuse. And to put it together, you're gonna to have to get it out of those archives and you're gonna to have to align it in some way. You're gonna to have to make it into a set of data. And there are real, real issues there with access control and final format and semantic alignment and all kinds of other things in order to be able to actually do that so that you could eventually reuse the data. And so so these are, this, is, this is kind of a framework that, uh, that I hope can help us think about what, what the nature of some of these processes are. The creation of data, the sharing of data, preservation, reuse, the preparing for reuse, which unfortunately is still a major, major problem, uh, and then um, actual reuse. Um, when we think about the production of data, um, you know, I'm, I've been around a while, it used to be used to be kind of simple. You know, you design an experiment, you tell them what to collect, they collect it, they put it in a computer, you add it up, you know, publish a paper, it was sort of okay. Um, I was involved in Clinical and Translational Science Institute at my university and uh, helped conceive of uh, our data practices and, and this is sort of what it looks like now. So now we have a lot of data capabilities. So if we're thinking about you know, what, what, what it looks like at the present time, data production is coming from a wide variety of different sources. It might be coming from the electronic health record or from the laboratory or patient reported outcomes, case report forms of clinical trials. Uh, maybe you bought data uh, uh, from somebody and then you have to put it all together. So this data assembly, all this data is coming from different directions. You're gonna do identity matching, ontology alignment. Uh, is this the, are these the variables they were talking about over here? Uh, provenance, tracking of the data, there's all kinds of assembly issues. And then there's all kinds of data validation issues. Is the data right? <laughs> so you're, you're, you're gonna look at various kinds of patterns in the data, uh, do various kinds of data management practices, monitoring, uh, process management if you've got flows set up. So those data validation things are, are quite significant. And all of that implies some kind of data infrastructure, some kind of cyber infrastructure that enables all of this kind of thing. And so you have your own repositories and registries and archives and indexing processes and data preservation, uh, uh, people working with you, database administration, all of those things. Then there's data enrichment and trying to fix and make the data better uh, in some way, um, usually through aligning it, phenotyping, uh, deriving variables of various kinds. Um, phenotyping is where you take a look at all these kinds of things and decide um, this person does have leukemia and that person does not. Okay, and that uh, turns out to be not an easy problem. Um, and so guidelines for phenotyping and algorithms for phenotyping and validation of phenotyping uh, itself is a very big issue. Uh, NLP, natural language processing, the processing of clinical data. Um, then there's data provisioning. You do have to like provide your data in some way to somebody sometimes. And that might be reports or summaries or aggregations of the things that you're putting together for your papers or visualizations. Sometimes there's published data sets and sometimes there's data sharing. Okay. And you have data analytics of various kinds, the kind of traditional uh, role of statisticians. And now 
you know, much has been co-opted under the term machine learning. Um, cutting across all of these things are things that maybe your institution is involved with, uh, reaching in, at, uh, dealing with things like data governance, process and policy, security, privacy, compliance, things that have to be in place in order to be able to handle data, particularly uh, protected health information. Um, data representation standards in which your research group is working with research groups around the world to make sure that what you're talking about and what they're talking about are actually the same thing. Um, and software tools of various kinds that we just heard a whole talk on uh, software tools, identification, development, assembly, integration, validation, access control to the tools. So the modern data environment is quite um, complex and in there somewhere is data sharing. So, so what is sharing? Okay. And I'm going to say it's kind of, I'm going to take a very simple view of it at the start and then we can kind of drill down, but I'm gonna just say it's providing scientific data that others can use. Because providing scientific data isn't good enough. It has to be so that others can use it. And if what we think about what we mean when we say that others can use, therein will lie the problems, okay? So providing scientific data that others can use. Is it important? We probably wouldn't be here if you didn't think it was important, but I think it's constantly, it behooves us to re-examine why it's important so that we can constantly make the case. Uh, I, I have several cases that, that, that uh, uh, we'll, we'll go with, here's a scientific argument first. Uh, There's a scientific argument around linking. So science is reductionist by nature. Different groups work on different parts of the problem. And then we need to combine those results across the different parts so that we can learn new things. Seems pretty clear, okay? So here's a reuse scenario, also involves BRCA1. Um, the question is find all the faculty members whose genetic work is implicated in breast cancer. That's hard to do um, because the people who know about molecular science and what molecules are involved in breast cancer are not the people who are looking at the papers. Um, so you have a faculty member, um, they work with a particular gene, that gene is implicated in breast cancer. The, the source of those two data, the, the, the fact that the faculty member works with a particular uh, substance and the fact that that substance is involved in a particular disease, those two ideas are, come from two different directions, curated by different people, um, and need to be associated in one place in order to be able to answer that kind of query. So it's a data linking kind of scenario. And here's another one. Um, so data linking, serious bottleneck for lots of different kinds of work in pharmaceutical and biotechnology domains. Uh, this is the result of a project that was done in, in the EU uh, to assemble 20 complete data sources from various uh, gene protein interaction pathway target drug disease patient uh, and put together approximately 5 billion uh, facts. Uh, that then could be analyzed uh, to try to determine um, what actually is implicated in what kinds of pathways and what kinds of mechanisms uh, in what kinds of diseases. And they, they called it the large knowledge collider. So I kind of, kind of like that idea. You know, we, we should have such a thing. <laughs> okay. okay, another scientific argument for sharing is, is pooling. We want to be able to combine or pool data from multiple experiments. And then in this way, we could perform what's called a mega-analysis, not a meta-analysis, that a meta-analysis, um, you look at the findings of various papers and do a, a particular kind of statistical uh, reasoning over the findings of the papers. Here, we want to actually have the data from different studies and pool that data and do one large analysis um, to increase the power to detect effects and be able to study different kinds of things that might have been out of the hands of uh, particular researchers. Um, pooling is not currently common. And it's extraordinarily difficult for all, the re for all the barriers that are involved in data sharing, uh, but it's also very, very difficult, even if you had the data, to determine whether it could be pooled um, from a scientific or slash statistical point of view. So sharing sufficient for pooling is extraordinarily rare currently. Okay. There's another reason for sharing, negative findings. So negative findings are, if you're, if you're in, if you're in science, you know negative findings are difficult to publish. That's unfortunate because they're findings. <laughs> we want to know everything that happened. We don't only want to know the things that were you know, positive. We want to know everything. 
So this inherent bias, the negative finding bias is inherent in literature, um, it can be counterbalanced by publishing all data from well-conducted studies. We're only interested in whether you did the work well. We're not interested in whether you got a positive or negative p-value. That, that, that's not interesting. What's interesting is you did, you did work and you produced data. Let's have it. So we're interested in all data from well-conducted studies, regardless of the findings. And this is the, the rationale, some, so there has been some good work done on this. So this is the rationale between the NCI Cancer Study Registry and clinicaltrials.gov, the US Clinical Trials Registry. Now, whether you could get the data is another issue, but at least you know that there was a study going on and you would know what the, what the findings might be. Um, and that helps you uh, track down some things. Um, Yes, for sharing the ethical argument, um, as we heard. Um, you know, without sharing of knowledge, there would be no advance in science, but then um, is it true that the data has to be shared or just the findings? So, you know, we're, we're still a little, you know, we, 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 we still have an edge on that argument. Okay? Um, and yes, the public funding argument for sharing. The taxpayers paid for the products of the research. The data do not belong to the researcher, they belong to the sponsor. Well, that's very unpopular okay, uh, with many of the people who are doing the work and you know, they, they put their lives into collecting that data and they believe that they ha exert some ownership over the data. Um, ownership's a tricky, tricky concept. Um, so there, but there is a public funding argument. So, so why don't scientists share their data? Um, so I was at this for my entire career uh, and I will say, I, I mean, Everything that we're about to hear is nothing new. They, these are arguments that scientists used on me um, over the course of, of the work. Um, okay, first, competitive advantage. Okay. Often takes the form of, I'm not finished with the data yet. Okay. I'm writing more papers. Okay. It's my, it's, it's what they paid me to do. If I share now, my competitors may publish or submit grant proposals using my data. And so I, I just can't, you know, it's, it's I, you know, a grant-funded researcher. If I don't get the grants, I'm not there. So competitive advantage. Um, and then a variation on competitive advantage is the prisoner's dilemma argument. Um, if you share and I don't, I have both of our data sets. And if I don't share, you only have your data. So that, that's, that's called, that's a variation of the prisoner's dilemma, and it proves that sharing is dumb, okay, if you're in a competitive situation, okay. So we really have to, you know, work hard to get past these kinds of things, okay. Okay, um, it's too difficult. Uh, the corollary here is I'm not paid, paid to share my data. I wrote a grant budget. I spent the money on rats. That's a good thing, okay. And if you want me to spend money on ontology or data managers or cyber infrastructure or whatever it is that you're talking about, I will spend less money on rats. Okay? Uh, and so that, that's kind of important to keep in mind. Um, sharing comes with costs, real costs. Uh, and so when there's a mandate that says, here's your budget, but by the way, share your data, that's just not, doesn't make any sense. You know, as, I, as a researcher, it doesn't make any sense. There's real, there's real work involved in sharing, and it's going to come from somewhere. Yeah, that, work, that work is going to come from something. Try going back to your dean and say you need another 20% on your grant to you know, share your data, see how that goes. You know. um, I don't know how to share my data. Well, uh, yeah, that may well be true. Um, the processes for sharing data can be quite complex. Uh, those advanced data capability things are not, uh, that's, that's not uh, abnormal. You know, the world is complicated. Uh, and it may be unknown to the scientist exactly how they're supposed to go about this. Okay, so uh, they may be coming up against requirements they really don't know how to handle. Uh, at least in my world, that's why there was a CTSI, was to help researchers with things they might have to do that they didn't know how to do. Um, no reward for sharing. They told me I have to do it. I did it. I checked the box. Next grant. I, I don't, this isn't helping me or my career. Okay. My career is built on my papers. Uh, I don't get anything for sharing my data. It's not on my Vita, it's not on my promotion packet. My sponsor does not penalize me for not sharing my data. Um, you know, I spend some time on, you know, the concept of research data management plans required for the grant. It's like, look, 
It only matters, it doesn't matter whether the RFA says it's a research data management plan. It matters whether the research data management plan is in the scoring criteria. If it's not in the scoring criteria, it doesn't matter what you wrote, <laughs> right? So just, <laughs> So, you know, I was involved in a $10 million center grant. It had a data sharing requirement. It wasn't in the scoring criteria. Our data management plan said, we will do whatever you tell us to do. Okay. I think it was approximately three sentences. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and we were funded. So, sure, you know, it has to be in the scoring criteria, otherwise it's useless. Okay. Um, my sponsor or employer won't let me share. Um, that's, uh, that's true. Um, depending on the nature of the research, the sponsor, the employer, the scientist may be prevented from sharing. Uh, and this has to do with de-identification, personal identity information, personal health information, uh, intellectual property. Uh, it could be time consuming. And some sponsors or employees just say the heck with it. You know, this is not, we're, not, we're not involved with that. It's not, not important to us. Okay? So it's not important to you. Okay? And finally, and, and maybe this is for me, the most pernicious argument. <laughs> so all of that seemed pretty serious. Here's the one that's, for me, the most serious. The scientist comes to me and says, the shared data cannot be reused. Cannot be reused. The context of the shared data is missing. Only the scientists who originally produced the data understand the data sufficiently well for meaningful reuse. And this is not a new idea, and this idea is, is current. Okay. So I've had principal investigators of major, major, major groups come to me and tell me exactly this. Okay. Cannot be reused. Only we understand the data. And by we, we mean the people in my lab. Right? And you're like, well, you wrote a paper. I mean, you know, yeah, 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 whatever. I mean, the paper is advertising for whatever it is that we did. And we have a finding, and we produced it, and, you know, I'm glad they like it, and we get it published. Okay? But if you try to get our data, and even if we provided you with the data, you would be lost. Okay? And we, you would have to join our group in order to understand the data. And that's pretty discouraging because, you know, we'd like to share data and we'd like to reuse it. Okay? Then you have, you know, major scientists telling you things like that. And so what is this context of the data that they're talking about? And, and it is true that the paper contains some of the context, but as we heard in the, in the case of the software, um, it's very minimal. It's very minimal. There's a whole, you know, iceberg of information going on about what that, what that scientific investigation is like, and you're getting, you know, 8,000 words or whatever you're getting, okay? And, and, you know, people understand. Perhaps we outgrew the paper, okay? The context became complex, okay? And whether it's software or laboratory procedure or, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are some pretty damaging findings around this in the, in the scientific literature around, um, Nomenclature in particular, so in the molecular sciences, nomenclature became complex. Uh, biological molecules, you know, you can't just, you can't call that methane, it's much more complicated than that. So if it has an, if it has an atomic weight of 34,000, you know, you better have an inchy on it, otherwise we don't know what molecule you're talking about, okay? And it turns out that within two years, 40% of the molecular literature can't be read because they don't, because a person outside the discipline can't tell what molecule they're, they're investigating because the nomenclature in the paper is, is out of date. There has to be an identifier, and if there's no identifier, there's no way to know what they did. There's no way, way to know even what molecule they were working on. Okay. So this, the, 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 the context is incredibly important, and, and we know that, you know, I mean, a lot of scientific literature is moving very rapidly, and, you know, we're only interested in papers that were published very recently because, you know, that, 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 that's where the interesting findings are, but they're also only, the only papers we can read. So the recent concern about reproducibility of science that, that Victoria is the expert on, you know, demonstrates some of the limitations of the paper provo for providing adequate context. People who have attempted to read papers and reproduce the work from the paper find there just isn't enough in the paper to tell them how to go about attempting to reproduce the work. 
So if you worked in clinical science or maybe laboratory science, maybe there's a protocol, uh, there's a laboratory protocol or there's a clinical protocol and, maybe, and it contains some of the context. Maybe it's supposed to contain all the context, but maybe there was a bunch of assumptions in there about what was actually being done that were short-handed in the protocol or short, and certainly short-handed, in my experience, certainly short-handed in the laboratory protocol. Um, the clinical protocol is being a little more elaborate, but the protocol may not be complete. And they often use local conventions that are sufficient for, di for directing the work that's going to be done, but they may not provide enough context to others. Just think about your, you know, your protocol being attempted in a different country. You know, is everything that the person needs to know in that protocol? Yeah. Everything that they need to know in that protocol. It may lack specificity required for reuse. The and obviously the protocols are not often published. And so what we got to see about the work was a small uh, a little piece of it, not what actually was done. That method section is very short. The protocol is long, and even it might not be sufficient. Okay. And then we could go into, you know, kind of cyber infrastructure um, uh, really visioning and say, well, even if it was published, it's not actually machine readable, so I couldn't actually use the protocol in any reasonable way. I would have to recreate it into some kind of structures that would allow me to uh, do something with it uh, at some scale. And if it was machine readable, is it actually like linkable back to the actual collected data? So one could imagine a world in which the actual collected data is fully specified by linkages back up into a protocol description that is completely sufficient for representing what was done. Um, and we're, we're a long way from there. Um, so, the, so the context problem is, is, a, is, a, is an elaborate and deep problem, I, I believe. Um, um, and so um, with that, we have uh, plenty of time for conversation and questions. Um, and, and, and the overarching question is what, what can be done to improve scientific data sharing? So we, we have these important notions of sharing data across scientific contexts. Um, what can we do to improve our ability to share data so others can use it? Um, and with that, I want to leave us on this figure just as a prompt for our discussion. So thank you. <laughs>